My name is Joshua Kamara. Um, I'm American, but I live in Singapore. Um, I'm a designer. Um, my training is in architecture and landscape architecture, um, but my partner and I work um, with a focus in early learning, um, childhood preschools, and also now uh, increasingly in playgrounds as well. I think that placemaking um, in urban design is very, very important when we think about the life of families in cities. Um, and play is a funny thing because we always tend to associate play with, with children specifically. It's always about playgrounds. Um, but if you think about it, people of all ages play, everyone plays, and families play together, hopefully. Um, a lot of the time, though, I think we kind of overlook that. We have play spaces that are dedicated for children. Um, and those are places that are very identified with children, you know, um, with kind of play features and play equipment that speaks more directly to them um, and less directly to the idea of families playing together, which as, as a parent, um, suddenly started to strike me as strange. Before I had kids, I never noticed that. It seemed to me that kids had playgrounds and that's where we went. But um, kids also model a lot from their parents. They learn play from their parents. Hopefully they learn creative play from their parents. And the more that we can create um, places that indicate um, or give a sense of ownership to whole families to find ways to play together um, outside of just usual models of kind of play frames or any kind of physical games, that seems to be very important. And I think the cities where they've done this most successfully are cities where they think about the whole family. And especially in Asia, where we think about families of three, sometimes four generations, um, creating a place where they can play together or where the different generations can support each other through play uh, seems very important. It's a very interesting thing that kids can create um, play spaces, very, very complicated magical things out of a cardboard box. I mean, a cardboard box with nothing on it. Um, and I know this as a parent because my house is so full of cardboard boxes right now. And every time I see them, sometimes I see a box and I fail to remember that actually it's a robot or it's a spaceship or it's a Formula One car, whatever. Um, what that does mean is that we sometimes don't have to go so far in terms of filling in all the blanks for kids. Applicants can consider imagining, reimagining existing infrastructure. Um, it's an interesting place to start thinking. It's not the only place to start thinking in cities, but I think infrastructure uh, is something we have to remember is designed by engineers um, who are a kind of designer. And the way that engineers think is they try and design something that does one function often extremely well. So if it's a canal, it should move the water as fast as possible. If it's a bridge, it should hold up as many cars as possible and try to reduce traffic. Designers look at those objects a little bit differently because with designers, we always try and say, how can this one object do many things at one time? And that's part of a kind of a more sustainable worldview, I think. It's not just to have a whole array of purpose-built items. Each one is very expensive and each one's very fixed and very complicated and takes years to produce. I think the idea is to imagine them now or reimagine them with a certain amount of flexibility. So that, what could a bridge be? I mean, I've I spent a lot of time in African cities. You know, if you go to a city like Lagos in Nigeria, there are churches under bridges, there's housing under bridges, there are markets under bridges. And the reason is just because the bridge provides a roof. And many people don't have a roof. So the bridge becomes many, many things that the engineer in a way didn't anticipate. For me, what I would be looking for um, in, in a proposal and I think there are many different ways that a proposal could be successful, but, but some of them would be to try and take into account the possibilities, um, again, of play being an engine for intergenerational interaction. This is something we see very often in, in Asian cities. You see it also in the U.S., where I'm from as well, where um, very often the middle generation, the parents, have long working days, and the grandparents and the children um, have a very intensive interaction. They're basically taken care of often by the grandparents for part of the day. When we design schools here, new schools, uh, and we propose new concepts for schools, we often um, say that they don't necessarily need to be preschools. They could be senior centers, uh, for example. I mean, the, the possibility of a good design being a good design for a number of different members of the community, and then to bring them together into one place that offers something for both, seems to be something that is a very important potential. And it's underserved because, again, we tend to think about play and we think about children and we think about seniors and we think about other kinds of programs for them. Uh, but, but we don't think about kind of bringing them together into one sort of space. And we definitely, I think, overlook play as an engine for bringing them together. So I'm very curious to see when, when the proposals come back um, whether participants manage to, to think that through and to find play spaces as an engine for serving a much broader, more holistic and integrated community, rather than just to think about children as children.
I, I think there are cities now that are getting it right. And what's interesting to us as kind of prof professional observers is how different the approaches are. Um, we were in Japan with our kids in Tokyo about six months ago, and friends of ours who lived there took us to an amazing park which would fit no um, definition that Americans, I think, or, or Singaporeans would ever accept about what a park is supposed to look like. It's just, it's kind of a piece of wilderness. And there are, it's a place where people seem to have abandoned a lot of old things, like old mattresses, and there's a little shed that you would see sort of in a farm, but a bit abandoned, and maybe a little bit. And everything looks a little bit dangerous. And the idea was that kids live in this very controlled space where everything uh, is designed to make them safer. The idea here is that they should have a moment of danger. So there were kids climbing on top of this roof and jumping off and landing on the mattresses, and we were shocked and we kind of looked around, and our kids took to it immediately because they understood the point. And the point was that here they could actually not be you know, in control for once, and that people wouldn't try and keep them safe. Um, it was a very interesting approach, and it required almost nothing. What it really was was rubbish. It was allowing them to be around a space where um, they could create anything they wanted to without people running after them and telling them what to do and what not to do. 